We asked over 10,000 people their top questions about gluten sensitivity. And I took the top 10, and that's what we're gonna be doing in today's show, answering those questions for you. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's zone. Today, we're tackling the top 10 questions we get about gluten sensitivity. And number one, very simply is, are my symptoms or disease processes related to gluten sensitivity? In essence, so many people develop nefarious or variety of different types of symptoms and aren't quite sure whether or not gluten is playing a role at triggering them. So the simple answer is here. We're gonna show you this published here from a research review on manifestations of gluten sensitivity that are not celiac disease. So in essence, you may not have bloating or intestinal pain or diarrhea. You may have something completely different. Well, published in this overview, you can see here a numerous amount of non-gut related symptoms from neurological and psychiatric diseases to oral mucocutaneous, in other words, in the mouth and facial manifestations, skin manifestations, blood manifestations, and liver manifestations. So again, seizure disorders, epilepsy, peripheral neuropathy, inflammatory myopathies, dental enamel defects, increased risk for cavities, Sjogren's disease, vitiligo, psoriasis, alopecia, and eczema, anemias, as well as damage to the liver. These are what are called extra intestinal manifestations of gluten. Now, if you have any of those types of problems, you don't know whether or not you're celiac or you don't know whether or not you have a gluten sensitivity, my advice would be to follow up with your doc and have them run the appropriate testing to make sure that gluten is not playing a role in the development of those types of diseases. Now, to take it just a little bit further, let's paint a word picture for you. This. Also, this was published actually in the British Medical Journal a number of years ago on gluten sensitivity as being a mini-headed hydra. So you can see this author, this, this group of researchers out at Oxford called gluten a hydra because there are so many different ways that gluten can, sensitivity can manifest in patients. And so if you think about the, the old Greek mythology hydra, right? So each head of the hydra, think of it as representing a different symptom, if you will. And so here we have just listed a few of those, hormone imbalance, bloating, acne, joint pain, fatigue, nausea, weight gain, all potentially manifestations of gluten sensitivity. And so we know gluten can cause a lot of things beyond celiac disease. So if you're not celiac, the takeaway message is don't dismiss gluten as a potential cause for your problems. Now I have a mega, mega comprehensive breakdown on this topic. It's a couple of hours long. I've got a major video and a, and a major blog that you can check out. And we'll put a link right up here for you. You can bookmark and go check that out after the show. Okay, question number two. What can I eat and what should I avoid? So the top two questions, you know you're gluten sensitive, what do you, what do you need to eat or what can you eat and then what shouldn't you be eating? Um, very, very simply put, let's, let's start here. What should I avoid? Avoidance really of any grain. So this is, you know, bread, pasta, cereal, grain-based alcohols, not all alcohols, but grain-based alcohols, a number of your beers and things of that nature, donuts, you know, baked goods, you know, things made with grain, wheat, barley, rye, oats, but also we recommend avoiding other grains as well, even though they can be labeled gluten-free. Um, I go into more depth, we'll put a link up to a much more in-depth uh, breakdown of that, but corn, rice, in my, my opinion, should also be avoided. So those are, you know, generally in a nutshell, what, what you need to avoid, you know, surface level. And then 
what can you eat? Let's talk about that because that's really probably the most empowering thing, you know, the most empowering thing you can understand. So vegetables, um, and this is not a comprehensive list of every vegetable known to man, but this is a place you can get started very simply, right? So there are a number of different vegetables that are perfectly fine. Um, red peppers, beets, rainbow chard, squashes, cabbage, broccoli, you know, cruciferous vegetables, and then the, the family of greens, lettuce greens, as well as squashes and root vegetables, pretty simple. And then there's fruit. Um, fruit, it's better to choose, in my opinion, the low glycemic fruits, which I have listed here, apples, pears, plums, berries, and watermelon as well. Um, not saying that you can't have some of these others that are higher glycemic, but it's, this is especially true because so many with gluten issues also have blood sugar regulation issues. There's a link between gluten and diabetes as well. Um, so sometimes these higher glycemic can be more problematic, but nonetheless, they are gluten-free and they are safe to eat. You just have to watch quantities. And then, so beyond that, we've got variety of different meats. So you've got, you know, you've got beef, you've got poultry, um, and then you've got also what's not on here is organ meats. So things like liver, kidney, if you, if you, you know, if you can do those things. And then as well, fish, any wild caught fish. Now it's important to remember about, um, about this is that with meat and poultry, you do want to choose grass fed. You want to choose organic where possible. Why? Because if it's not grass fed, it's being fed grain. And not that there's grain in the meat per se, but those grains they're feeding these commercialized farmers are feeding these, these animals are loaded with pesticide, right? These are GMO grains that have been double doused with glyphosate and you don't wanna eat meat that's contaminated with those types of chemicals, especially if you're gluten sensitive, struggling with illness and trying to overcome illness. A lot of people fail to recover even on a gluten-free diet because the quality of the food they're choosing is poor. The same is true when we're talking about seafood, look for that delineation, wild caught. Now there's this new term in marketing, it's called sustainable. Sustainable means nothing for human health. It means that the farmer can sustainably grow fish in a net in the ocean, feeding them genetically modified grains as a, as a food source. How many fish have you ever seen jump out of an ocean into a cornfield and snack down? That doesn't happen and it's not the native food of fish. So we want wild caught because we want the fish eating what's in their element. This is what makes the food healthy for us. And then back going backwards just a little bit here. So we're talking about fruits and vegetables. So with these, again, the, the, the choice should be organic, again, to avoid the pesticide exposure. Now, if you want to get a full breakdown, I've, I've got some links up here as well on the board. These are all just resource links for you. Very comprehensive resources going much greater in depth on what foods to avoid beyond just the traditional wheat, barley, and rye, but also what foods you can eat um, beyond what we just discussed. And then as well, uh, a major recipe index with hundreds of recipe options for you with healthy and tasty meal planning um, produced by myself and my wife, as well as our staff, our Gluten-Free Society staff chef. So um, take advantage of those resources. Okay, question number three. What happens if I eat gluten? And this is, this is the, the, the caveat to this question is, if, I'm, if I am gluten sensitive, what happens if I eat gluten? So what is actually the mechanism of what happens when being exposed to gluten? So I've got a nice diagram to kind of break it down for you. Um, this is a simplified diagram, and this is an oversimplification of, of basically what happens. So what happens, you're gluten sensitive and you eat gluten, okay, mechanistically, biochemically, this oversimplified diagram is a breakdown of what happens. So first it's important to understand that gluten sensitivity is not a disease so much as it is a state of genetic predisposition. So think of it as, you know, if you have the markers, genetic markers, you are predisposed for this to occur. And so, what happens is on chromosome six, you have these genes and then they code for an antenna that sits out on the surface of your immune cells. So this is a white blood cell, an immune cell. And so again, HLA-DQ genes code for the production of this antenna. Now it looks like a kind of a, 
a Pac-Man shape, right, just facing up. But what happens is this receptor, when gluten comes in and sits into this receptor, what happens is you get a reaction. And there are different kinds of reactions, but the gist of it is when gluten binds to this receptor, it triggers an inflammatory response. And that inflammation is what happens that creates the damage. So this, this inflammation, by the way, if it occurs in the small intestine and it causes enough damage, this is going to generally be diagnosed as celiac disease. Now, if this inflammation occurs, let's say in the skin, um, there's a condition called DH, dermatitis herpetiformis, that we might see manifest. Now, if this inflammation occurs in the liver, you can get a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. If this inflammation occurs in joints, there's overlap with gluten causing rheumatoid arthritis and other forms of autoimmune arthritis. So the gist is the gluten exposure triggers an inflammatory response that leads to damage and the damage wherever it occurs is unique to the individual. Everybody has their own unique set of responses. Not everybody is going to react to gluten by manifesting a celiac conundrum. So this is a more complex looking diagram. So I, we can, I wanna give credit where credit is due. Dr. Aristio Vajani, very intelligent, very bright uh, PhD doc who um, is an immunologist, but he, he created this slide and so Basically, this is just a more complex diagram. If you look, if you look right here, you see those two term, that term HLA, DQ2, DQ8. Okay, that's the genetics. That's the genetic predisposition we were just talking about. You can see this, what looks like a little purple Y structure. That's the HLA, DQ, receptor that we were just talking about. So again, going from complex looking diagram to a more simplified looking diagram, the simplification here, right? So that, that same receptor is this receptor. So now what happens, you can see here these little green circles, that's gluten, okay? So gluten can basically break through the gut lining. It creates holes or damage to the cell lining and causes what's known as increased permeability, oftentimes referred to as leaky gut. This is one of the side effects of what gluten can contribute to. And so once the gut's leaking, you get these little proteins, these little gluten proteins start leaking through. And so when they leak through, okay, one of the things that happens, you have a specialized type of white blood cell called a dendritic cell, and the dendritic cell will bind that gluten and it will take it over to the immune cells, to a mature dendritic cell. This HLA-DQ receptor then receives that gluten and then it presents it to another type of cell called a CD4 cell. So again, this gets super complicated, which is why I oversimplified it. But there are two main kinds of reactions that you can get. You can get what's known as a TH2 reaction, which is a B cell, a type, specialized type of white blood cell, and you get the production of antibodies. Okay, you can also have what's known as a Th1 reaction where you get the production of these chemicals that are inflammatory in nature. Chemicals like TNF-alpha and interferon gamma are, are examples of that. And then these chemicals and antibodies cause mucosal destruction and epithelial cell damage, which further contributes to the autoimmune problems. And this is why when people have autoimmune disease, one of the most likely culprits is actually gluten. That's why gluten is linked to so many different types of autoimmune disease. Again, so this is just a complex reality of what happens when you eat gluten. Gluten causes leaky gut, it penetrates through the gut wall, it interacts with the immune system. The byproduct of that interaction is to produce antibodies or to produce inflammatory chemicals. These reactions then create inflammatory damage to multiple tissues within the body. It's not just limited to damaging of the gut. So, in a nutshell, that's what happens when you eat gluten, that's the damage. Now, we've got a link here for if you wanna go learn more about gluten damage and how long it takes to get rid of gluten damage and how long it takes to get gluten out of your system, I've got a full comprehensive breakdown of that for you there. Now, we would be remiss to not also talk about non-gluten components of grain that cause inflammatory damage. Because so many people 
question whether or not they're gluten sensitive. And some people aren't gluten sensitive, but what they're reacting to are other things in the grain. This is why I wrote No Grain, No Pain. It was to discuss the rest of what happens, right? So we get what else is in grain that can cause damage besides gluten. So we have gluten here, right? But we have all these other things that are found in grain. So heavy metals, excessive omega-6, we know that uh, grains directly can cause leaky gut. We know that they're comprised predominantly of excessive carbohydrates. We know they have genetic, many of them are genetically modified and they contain pesticides and they contain mycotoxins as well as molds. So molds are basically the parents of mycotoxins. And then they contain these other proteins called ATIs, amylase trypsin inhibitors. And so these other aspects, these not, let's just cross gluten out. Let's say we have these other factors in grain that we also know can cause chronic inflammation and pain. And one of the main mechanisms that occurs as a result of those other elements has to do with in your gut called a TLR4 uh, receptor. So a TLR4, this stands for toll-like receptor. These are little tiny receptors that line the, uh, the GI tract. And so when you're exposed to things like molds and mycotoxins or ATIs, which are again proteins predominantly found in grain that aren't gluten, uh, when you're ex overexposed to omega-6, these things will trigger an inflammatory response through engaging this aspect of the immune system. So this is not an antibody. So some people when they go get tested and they don't test positive for antibodies um, for gluten, it's because when they eat grain, this is what's happening. And so their test is gonna come back a little bit construed and confusing. So again, these are other elements within grain that can also drive inflammation through TLR receptors. It's important that you understand that because it's important that you understand that the testing for gluten is not always accurate um, for many different reasons, but sometimes it's accurate, but you still do better on a gluten-free diet because this is another follow-up question that we get is, I tested negative for celiac disease, but I feel better when I don't eat grain. Why does that happen? This is one of the big reasons why that happens. Okay. Let's move on to question number four. Why didn't I experience gluten reactions before and will those reactions ever go away? All right. So, there's a lot of things that can accelerate or um, cause a person to begin reacting to gluten. Remember that gluten sensitivity, as we said earlier, gluten sensitivity is a genetic predisposition. And so, the fact that it's a genetic predisposition, there are definitely things that you can do to accelerate a gluten reaction or, or to start reacting to it more aggressively. And one of them is alcohol. You can see here, this was uh, published in PLS1. Does alcohol increase reactivity to gluten? These researchers say a possible explanation may be that anti-gliadin antibodies arise in patients with genetic susceptibility. Again, genetic predisposition, keyword, HLAD. Q genes following a chronic immunological insult, alcohol, centered on the cerebellum. Alcohol has previously been associated with antibodies to transglutaminase, which is the same uh, enzyme that we know gluten can, can create an antibody response to and is known to evoke an immu immunogenic reaction. Alcohol-related cerebellar degeneration may in genetically susceptible individuals induce sensitization to gluten. So this is you know, a gluten accelerant, if you will. Why wasn't I reacting before? Maybe you went out and, and uh, we see this a lot in college kids where they'll go off to college, they'll start drinking, and then they'll start reacting much more aggressively or much more severely to gluten, whereas prior that college experience, they weren't having that. So it's an accelerant. It increases the likelihood of the reaction to occur at earlier ages. So this is one of the reasons why we'll see people um, transition to reacting from, from before where they weren't really reacting. Here's another reason. It's with antibiotics. So you see antibiotic exposure and the development of celiac disease. So antibiotic use was associated with celiac disease. The positive association between antibiotic use and subsequent celiac disease 
but also with lesions that may represent celiac disease suggest that intestinal dysbiosis, let's blow that up a little bit, intestinal dysbiosis may play a role in the pathogenesis of celiac disease. And this, is, this has actually been confirmed numerous times. They're looking now more and more and more at the microbiome and they're looking at things that cause a disruption of the microbiome. Of course, antibiotics being one of them, but there are other things that also will disrupt the microbiome. And, and uh, you know, as an example, pesticides, herbicides, disrupt the microbiome because they're natural antibiotics, right? I mean, they're, they're, that's what they're designed to do is kill things, including the, the microflora in your GI tract. So if you're eating foods that are contaminated with these things, you're certainly going to disrupt your microbiome. We know that fluoride can disrupt the microbiome. We know that chlorine can disrupt the microbiome. These are both antibiotics. Matter of fact, a lot of antibiotics are made with fluorine, fluorines and chlorine. So um, it's important that you understand if you understand this you can buy organic you can mitigate your exposure to these things and reduce your risk of potential greater reactions but again one of the let's talk about one of the reasons why antibiotics also can do this one of the side effects of an antibiotic is candida overgrowth this is a very very common side effect of people that go on antibiotics um, for infection is they end up with a yeast overgrowth or candida. And one of the things I want you to understand about candida is that there's a protein that candida makes. It's called a hyphal wall protein. You can see here HWP1. Okay, the protein HWP1, hyphal wall protein 1, expressed on the pathogenic phase of candida albicans, meaning it's when candida is growing, it expresses this protein. Okay, and this protein has a sequence analogy with the gluten protein, gliadin. Meaning that gliadin and yeast protein look alike. HWP1, which is again, hyphal wall protein. So they, they, they mimic each other. So somebody that goes on an antibiotic and has a candida overgrowth, and then the candida is generating high amounts of HWP1, we now get a gluten-like acceleration or reaction. And so you can see down here, you have the genetic susceptibility, you go on the antibiotic, the antibiotic causes the yeast overgrowth, the yeast produce proteins that mimic gluten, we now get intestinal, or it doesn't have to be just intestinal, it can also be systemic beyond the intestine, and so you can develop celiac disease or other related gluten disorders. Okay, so these are reasons why, again, people might have a history where they weren't reacting and then they went on an antibiotic or they went on multiple rounds of antibiotics for whatever reason, and now they're, intoler they're intolerable of gluten, and so they started to develop problems associated with it. So that's one of the big reasons why. I've got an entire course on other things that can cause an acceleration of reactions to gluten. Again, this is in people that um, felt like they were tolerating it before and then all of a sudden now they're not tolerating it. Maybe they're in their 30s or 40s, but they've been eating bread or grains their whole life. You can check that class out right here if you want to bookmark that for later. There's just more compre comprehensive information about things that can accelerate reactions to gluten. Question number five, can you confirm a gluten sensitivity without testing? And the simple answer is yes and no. And let me, let me clarify. So yes in the sense where you go on a, let's just say you go on an elimination diet, cut grain out of your diet, And you, you, know, you can do that. My advice, if you're gonna try to do it this way, uh, it doesn't cost you anything except a diet change, minimum three months. And the reason why it takes three months for the most part to get the current gluten that's in your system out of your system. So if you go on an elimination diet for a week or two weeks 
or even four weeks, you may not notice much of a difference or a change because you're still reacting to gluten that you had already been eating. So you really gotta go, if you're gonna do an elimination, go minimum three months, ideally though, six months. Because by the time all the antibodies are out of your system, this is about the length of time that actually takes. The, the half-life of gluten antibodies is, in some cases, is up to 90 days, which is three months. But, but many people with gluten sensitivity will start to feel better in that three-month time range, although some, it can take longer. So you can confirm that, sort of, right? So if you eliminate gluten and grains, for that period of time and you feel better, there's kind of a confirmation in that you've cut out a food, your body is saying, hey, I feel better, and you know that feedback can be very valuable for you. It doesn't tell you, though, why you feel better, it just tells you that you feel better. And so there are a lot of reasons why eliminating gluten and grain might help a person feel better. And as I showed you earlier, there are those non-gluten aspects to grain, like the mold and the pesticides and the mycotoxins and the heavy metals. And so some people would feel better on an elimination diet like this not necessarily because of gluten, but maybe because of those other things. And so that's where the answer is no. Like you can, you can not test, you can do an elimination diet, you might feel better, but it's not really technically confirming whether or not gluten was causing your problem in the first place. It could have been those other things. So that's why the answer is yes and no. Now, if you really wanna know whether or not you're, you're gluten sensitive, in my opinion, the best way to determine that is to understand whether you have those genetic predisposition genes that I've talked about uh, earlier, glutenfreesociety.org genetic testing. You can go learn more about those genetic predisposition genes there. Now, what you can also do, so what you can also do um, is you can go to Gluten Free Society and you can take our quiz now this quiz is just gonna ask you some questions. You can see the examples of those questions here, but um, you know you're in the right place if you see that Gluten-Free Society logo. But you can take our free quiz, there's no charge to do this, and this is gonna give you an idea of whether or not you might be gluten sensitive. But again, the fundamental flaw in the quiz or the elimination diet is it's not, you know, they're not definitive, whereas genetic testing is gonna be definitive. You have those gene predispositions, you know you're gonna react to gluten. Now it may happen sooner or later, but you know you're gonna have that predisposition. So in my opinion, that's the best way to confirm with a degree of certainty. Okay, question number six. Why can some people still tolerate gluten? Well, not everyone's gluten sensitive. Um, this shouldn't be a news flash, but humans have been eating grains for thousands of years and not everyone is gonna have a reaction per se uh, to gluten, and so some people are gonna tolerate it just fine. What we wanna kind of siphon through though is some people are reacting to it and don't realize they're reacting to it. And so, as I, as I showed you earlier on the symptoms of gluten, there are a lot of different kinds of symptoms. And so, you know, one manifestation of gluten can be rheumatoid arthritis. Another manifestation can be liver inflammation or liver hepatitis. Another manifestation might be eczema. Another manifestation of gluten might be hypothyroid. So you've got, you know, to date, I think it's upwards of around 200 different types of symptoms, diseases, syndromes that are linked or associated or can be caused by gluten. And the problem is most doctors aren't trained to catch them very well. And this is, I've seen this, I see this all the time in RA. I see so many people with RA that get better when they change their diet, when they go gluten-free. I see a lot of people that have multitudes of different diseases, but you know, one thing that might happen is their skin completely clears up when they change their diet, or their thyroid medicine becomes too strong when they change their diet. And so you may have a number of other diseases, not think that you're gluten sensitive, not feel bad necessarily when you eat gluten, but gluten may be driving the inflammation that's causing your other problems that your doctor hasn't linked to it. So it's very important uh, that you keep that into consideration, especially those of you who don't feel bad after eating gluten and you haven't been tested, but if you have multiple other forms of disease or diagnoses or other health issues, you should be aware of 
whether or not gluten might be contributing to those because the bigger gap here is, yes, not everybody's gonna react to gluten, but many people are reacting to it and they're manifesting diseases or symptoms that are not typically linked to it. And so it completely gets missed and they continue to go on thinking that they're just fine with that donut or with that bowl of cereal. Okay, number seven, how long after going gluten-free will I start to feel better? The general time frame is three to six months, and this is for most people. There's going to be some degree of improvement within that time frame. Now, I've seen some people react much faster. I've seen people react within days of going gluten-free, and many of you who watch this show have reported back to me after changing your diet within one, two, three, four days, dramatic reductions of pain, dramatic reductions of inflammation. So it can be that fast, although it's not that fast for everyone. Some people, it's more along this line where there's just a, you know, if this is a symptom graph, it's just a kind of like a, a slow state, steady improvement over time. So if the bottom represents time and, and this up here represents improvement, um, we see kind of a general curve of a trend that's just a slow, steady improvement over time uh, in that three to six month range. Now, a lot of times though, if, if you're at a place where you're, you've developed autoimmune disease, so if you have a form of autoimmune, in my experience with autoimmune disease, that general, it's 18 months. Now, it doesn't mean you don't start feeling better before 18 months, because feeling better is the question, but really to get autoimmune disease in many cases to go to sleep it takes at least 18 months because you need three turnovers three cycles of immune cells right that in one cycle takes six months so six times three being 18 months which is where that that number comes from so again the answer varies from person to person can be as quickly as days but if you're, if you're really trying to give the diet a try and you're not sure and you haven't been tested and you really want to give it a fair shake, six months would be the recommendation for you to start with it going, dedicating six months because the first eight weeks or so are going to be just dedicated to learning curve, right? You, there's a 12, eight to 12 week learning curve when people go gluten free and a lot of times they do it wrong, they do it incorrectly, they make tons of mistakes and these small mistakes, you know, can lead to persistent inflammation. It only takes is a, what's called a 20 parts per million rule, which 20 parts per million is one breadcrumb. So that's the size of gluten that can cause inflammation for two to three months. And if you're new to the diet and you're not, and you're not really being restrictive enough, like you could have 20 parts per million coming through and you could be persistently reacting and not feeling improvements because you're making mistakes. So keep that in mind. So again, the answer is it's different for different people, but days to months is a general answer for you to focus on. Okay, let's talk about question number eight. How do you heal your gut after years of damage? So as we said before, the leaky gut component of gluten, and we know gluten causes leaky gut, um, thanks to the great work of Dr. Alicia Fasano at Harvard. When the gut is leaking, you can remove gluten from the diet, and if you're healthy, a lot of times the body can heal itself. But what happens with gut damage for many people is malnutrition, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and I did um, an entire module on this in my Glutenology Masterclass is strictly about nutrition. Because one of the things that we have found clinically and in research is that people with gut inflammation over prolonged periods of time develop severe enough malnutrition. And this malnutrition cycles and, and it prevents healing. So if the gut's already damaged and you need nutrients to heal, but if you're malnourished because of years of gut damage, you can get stuck, you can plateau, and so the healing process is diminished or is not, not effectively working. And so this is one of the biggest conundrums that we see with people is that they don't heal because they're malnourished. So measurement, so the thing to do here would be to measure nutrition status. You measure nutrition status, then you can accordingly supplement. There are some research studies that show that 
people won't actually heal until this happens, until they actually do this. And I've seen this to be the case clinically in a number of people where they hit a plateau, where yes, they get the gluten out, but they have such severe damage and such severe malnutrition that they're, they're not overcoming the healing plateau. So that measurement can sometimes become very important. Now, of course, there are other things that can play a role in gut damage as well. And I put up a link here for you. We have 10 fundamental things you need to be focused on in order to overcome leaky gut. And if you're not focusing on those things, you can also hit a plateau. Nutrition is one of the main, but those others are also very important. So question number nine, will I experience gluten withdrawal symptoms? Simple answer is yes. Many people going gluten-free will actually feel worse before they start feeling better. And some of the symptoms include low-grade fever, shakes, chills, irritability and agitation, headaches, visual disturbances. These are all the same kinds of symptoms that we might see in somebody going through drug withdrawal. And this is why. You see here, the opioid effects of gluten exorphins, okay? Gluten can be degraded into several morphine-like substances named gluten exorphins, sometimes called gluteomorphin, proven opioid effects and could mask the deleterious effects of gluten protein on gastrointestinal lining and function. What's interesting about this, because I was, I was talking earlier about some people eat gluten and they don't feel bad, but they still go on and develop disease. But when they eat gluten, they don't feel bad. And this actually is one of the reasons this can happen is that gluten can mask its own toxicity because morphine has pain reduction effects. And so that in and of itself, gluten can hide its toxicity. Now, because it mimics morphine, when you're getting off of it, you can experience what feels like morphine withdrawals. And this is why, again, some people feel worse getting off of gluten for the first few weeks. And so, you know, generally my experience, people that experience this, the two to three week time frame, generally where they might feel worse. Not everybody has this withdrawal-like symptom, but it definitely happens to some folks. Now, it, one of the things you can do to overcome this is vitamin B3 niacin, you know, anywhere from 100 to 300 milligrams a day can be a, a helpful thing to do. Um, and taking that with a B complex might also be of great benefit to help, um, to help kind of buffer some of these symptoms. And the other that can be, really be helpful is vitamin C. And you know, upwards of five plus grams daily for an adult to buffer some of those withdrawal symptoms. So. Can you feel worse getting off of gluten? Yes, this is one of the reasons why the morphine-like content or proteins um, that are broken down can actually create a withdrawal scenario for some people. Now, there's another aspect to um, feeling worse before feeling better for some folks, and that has to do with carbohydrate. So when people go gluten-free, a lot of times because of the paralysis of the new diet, so their carb levels are dropping. So their carbs drop dramatically and it almost sends them, in some cases, if they drop low enough into like a keto flu-like state. And this has to do with just the, re the, the major reduction of carbohydrates initially. This, can, this aspect of side effect can be um, can be alleviated by just making sure that you're getting other carbohydrate in the diet, even though although they, did, they don't need to be grains. Again, remember that, you know, statistically speaking, 70% of the calories in the U.S. diet for most people come from wheat. And so the carbohydrate, the vast majority of carb they're consuming is, is from grain. And so when you cut that out, you cut out kind of Overall, you cut out total carbohydrate intake. And so, that, again, that can be alleviated by increasing non-grain-based carbohydrates. If you're having more of the withdrawal from the morphine-like, you can take the B3, you can take the vitamin C to aid in that, and then just give it time and know that it will pass. Okay, does gluten sensitivity affect mental health? 
This is a huge, huge part of gluten. Gluten has been shown in many cases to create a number of neurological problems. This study here published in Neurology is summary, gluten sensitivity is a systemic autoimmune disease which with diverse manifestations, this disorder is characterized by abnormal immunological responsiveness to ingested gluten and genetically, we keep talking, seeing this genetic susceptibility which is why I recommend gene testing. Um, although neurological manifestations in patients with established celiac disease have been reported since 1966. That earliest study was actually mental disorder, schizophrenic-like behavior. It was not until 30 years later that in some individuals gluten sensitivity was shown to manifest solely with neurological dysfunction, neurological damage to the nerves. Remember your brain is a big nerve, right? So furthermore, the concept of extraintestinal presentations without gut damage, which is what enteropathy means, has only recently become accepted. So this is, again, a summary from Dr. Haji Vasilou and his team at Oxford. Uh, and these guys have been researching the, the neurological implications of gluten exposure for decades. We also have some other very interesting articles here to share with you. This one published in a psychiatric journal, is schizophrenia rare if grain is rare? And so, um, here we've got neuroactive peptides from grain glutens are the major agents evoking schizophrenia in those with genotypes. When these people became partially westernized, so th what this study did is it actually it was very interesting is it looked at indigenous peoples off in Papua New Guinea as well as Malaita and Solomon Islands and they found that these individuals, when they were partially westernized, meaning when grains were introduced into their staple, uh, into their diets as staple, especially wheat, barley, rye, uh, or not wheat, barley, rye, wheat, barley, beer, and rice, the prevalence reached European levels, meaning that there's a certain percentage of the population that has schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders. But in these islanders, they didn't have the same levels of schizophrenia, but when their diets were westernized, their levels of schizophrenia grew to match Western cultures. So again, the, the road or the bridge, if you will, to grains and glutens causing the potential for neurological um, disease and manifesting as schizophrenia. So you see the, the, the summary here. Findings agree with pre previous epidemiological and experimental results indicating that grain glutens are harmful to schizophrenics. And then we have more research on mood disorders. Mood disorders and gluten, it's not all in your mind. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis of multiple studies. You can see three randomized controlled trials and 10 longitudinal studies with 1,100 plus patients were measured and you can see a gluten-free diet significantly improved depressive symptom scores in gluten-free diet treated patients. You can also see here our review supports the association between mood disorders and gluten intake and in susceptible individuals. The effects of a gluten-free diet on mood and subjects without gluten-related disorders should be considered in future research. So the research is pretty clear. People going gluten-free have profound impacts on mental disease and mental disorders. We've seen research now come out on things like schizophrenia, on bipolar disease, on ADD, ADHD, as well as on depression, depressive disorders. So is gluten associated or linked to mental disease? You bet, absolutely it can be. And again, we'll put up a link for more information on how gluten causes brain inflammation directly through damage to the gut. So that gut brain access and gluten's association with disrupting it. Okay, so that's our top 10. I want you to walk away from this video. And many of you, this was just kind of like a a fire hydrant of information on a lot of different topics, but I want you to have a walk away from this video where you can go do a deeper dive if you'd like to do a deeper dive. And so I invite you to sign up for our masterclass, Glutenology, and you can do that right here. We'll put a link up for you, glutenology.net forward slash registration, 
or forward slash register. This class is a master class. It's 10 modules, 14 hours, in depth, everything you ever thought you wanted to know or needed to know about gluten. And this is especially important for those of you who are new to the diet and think you're following it correctly and maybe you're still struggling. I mean, I get this a lot. People come to me in my practice. They've been on a gluten-free diet for years. They're still struggling. They still got autoimmune problems. And a big part of the reason why is they don't really understand what they need to be doing within the diet and they're doing it wrong. So check out the Glutenology Masterclass and that will get you moving in the right direction. Again, it's just a free service from me to you to help you navigate this world because so many times doctors don't spend the time to educate patients about the depth and magnitude of the damage gluten can cause or the diseases that it's related to and even beyond that how to appropriately go gluten free without making the tons of mistakes that can land you in an inflammatory hot water thanks so much for tuning in to dr osborne zone we'll see you thursday for live q a